of the Times Union and Jacksonville.com's budget chats with Mayor John Payton. Today our subject is arts and culture. It's one of the areas that's a social fabric for the city, but also one of the many areas in the budget that could be imperiled by shrinking revenues. Uh, today we're joined by the mayor and by the city's community officer, Rosalind Phillips, to talk more about this topic. Thanks for joining us. David, thank you for having us. Thank you. Mayor, uh, there was there was a vote by the City Finance Committee yesterday that appears that there's some opposition to uh, having a tax increase in Jacksonville, and cultural events is one of the areas that I think would be hit hardest from the look of the potential right. cuts. Can you describe some of those areas that could be? Well, I think, you know, naturally, um, uh, I was disappointed but not surprised. Um, the charge to divest in the city was led by Clay Yarborough, uh, who ironically uh, is the guy who has the $55,000 secretary. Um, insists on having a pension plan for a part-time job uh, and passed a, an amendment last night that basically uh, adds $200,000 that we did not have to pay for in the processing of a notice should the council make a different decision. So I was naturally disappointed but not surprised uh, considering his track record. Uh, when we talk about limiting the millage, um, we certainly see um, that uh, projects like this, like cultural and, and artistic venues, will be at risk. Uh, because when you start competing uh, cultural events with fire stations, community centers, and libraries, you can imagine who wins. Um, my concern is if we start divesting um, the art and culture line item in our budget, uh, which I think adds to a tremendous quality of life here, is at risk. Uh, what are those things? Well, clearly, um, we invest in cultural institutions. Um, these are premier artistic organizations that um, bring a lot of tourism to town and then provide a lot of entertainment for our local uh, citizens. Um, we have special events. Uh, we bring people to downtown Jacksonville, millions a year, uh, and provide about $200 million in economic impact with filling hotel rooms and, and filling up our, our restaurants and our retail facilities with fireworks shows, with jazz festival, with the World of Nations, uh, those things that bring people together to celebrate our community and our, and our river. Um, my concern, obviously, is that um, we don't want to take a step back. Uh, these are events that are, in many instances, free to the public. Um, and, and while it would be a immediate short-term savings to capture that uh, expenditure on the line item. Long-term, uh, we'd lose economic impact, and I think we'd make Jacksonville less special. Uh, so I do not support the efforts by uh, members like Clay Garborough, who are, uh, have been determined to undermine the arts and culture community for years. Um, he has a track record of doing this, and we will fight him as best we can. You had mentioned the idea of uh, cultural events versus fire stations and police stations, and, and who's going to win in that. but. Uh, of the non-public safety dollars, that one-third of the budget that you can take from, wh why, why does so much of the potential cutting fall onto the back of arts and culture? Well, I think it's, it's what I call uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, it's a line item on the budget. Um, it represents a couple million dollars. Um, in the totality of our budget, it's not much money, but it is low-hanging fruit in that uh, it is not a fire station. It is not a community center. It is not a library. Um, and... and uh, it's usually, my experience has been, it's usually the target uh, for cuts. So uh, um, my concern is, too, also, there's a long-term penalty of doing that. Um, we do generate economic impact, and we do provide things that make our city special, just like every other city in America, um, uh, that people enjoy, free venues that people enjoy. And so uh, we will be advocating that we not divest uh, in arts and culture in our community. We actually try, try to hold, with this millage increase, I'm recommending maintain status quo. Ideally, we'd like to do more. We'd like to improve the riverfront, our river walk, Met Park, uh, Friendship Fountain, uh, those public spaces that make downtown special we want to invest in. South Bank River Walk is obviously in desperate need of repair. We don't have money allocated for that today. Uh, Met Park is 30 years old and in desperate need of repair. Uh, we have a lot of expenditures um, that, that, quite frankly, are becoming backlogged um, for repairs and maintenance uh, because there hasn't been the resources to do it. And, and, and my concern is if we start down this road of divesting, um, we will paint a picture of a city that, quite frankly, uh, would be hard to be want to be a part of. And you had mentioned earlier the idea of attracting tourists to Jacksonville. With that in mind, a $200 million economic impact, why, why can't some of these events become self-sustaining? Well, how would you charge for a fireworks show? I mean, I mean, you've got hundreds of thousands of people watching from all over the city. I mean, uh, you, um, so it's not like you have controlled entry and, and access. The Jazz Festival, we did try charging, um, and then the final analysis, we said, look, um, the, the, 
the incremental difference between the revenue we generate um, versus it being free is not worth it. And we have so many people enjoy it, and it brings people to our downtown. It fills up our restaurants. It increases our bed tax. Uh, there's there's a return on that. It's not immediate, but there's a return on that. Uh, World of Nations, uh, a great celebration of the variety of cultures we have in this community, which we should celebrate, um, and showcase, uh, and and we do that at Met Park. So. Um, you know, we do try to charge admission where we can if there's one entrance and, and there's a way to capture the dollars. But uh, at the end of the day, and in, in a recession where families are struggling, uh, I, I think it's nice for the city to provide venues um, that are free. Um, sometimes Disney World is too expensive. Uh, you know, going to the nearby water park might be too expensive. But um, having a venue downtown that creates activity, creates economic impact, it's free to our citizens, is something that we should be able to provide. How have these events been altered over time by other budget crunches in years past? We, we've actually been trimming uh, the budget, and as we've mentioned on your previous chats, uh, the non-public safety side of our government is smaller today than when I took office. Uh, so when we have a tight budget, it's, it's always that sector we go to, uh, and that's why you have a park system that's grossly underfunded, a library system that is, is, is having it doubled its size and, and capacity but has had very little dollars to go with it. Um, the fact that our public works uh, budget is so anemic relative to other cities. So um, that is that is that's the focal point. Public safety certainly is fundamental, uh, and for that reason, we we continue to invest. We're trying to shed ourselves of that reputation of being the murder capital, and we look forward to having more conversations later in the week on the public safety topic. But again, um, this is the area where you know most people go for cuts, and we've been whittling and whittling mm-hmm. through time. And this year, uh, if, if my memory serves me correct, that the Jazz Fest, despite a lot of rain that week, was actually quite successful. Was that uh, a, a beacon for this year's budget? And as you started to look at events that could go, how, how did that factor in? You know, I, I'm so proud of uh, Teresa O'Donnell and her team. Uh, they put on a phenomenal event. The weather absolutely worked against them, but it was still enormously successful. We changed the venue uh, into a street setting, uh, more like New Orleans type environment. Um, uh, and again, another challenge with that is charging because you have so many points of entry because it was really truly a, tr- a street festival. Um, but it was, a, it was a huge success and, and it, I think the venue change is something we're going to keep uh, through time. Uh, even though we have some remodeling going on at Laura Street, we may have to move it uh, slightly next year, but um, it was a fantastic event and, and uh, um, we advocate doing more, not less. How do events like this fit into the idea of developing a downtown core? We've, we've talked before about uh, green space and sprucing up the city to try and attract businesses, but having a jazz fest and having an air show, how, how does that help attract investment? Well, let's back up. I think first we have to acknowledge that uh, it is in our best interest to encourage people to live downtown. Uh, with our population expected to double in the next 50 years, uh, it is smart growth for us to have people live where the infrastructure already exists and you're not recreating community in the suburbs where you have to build fire stations, schools, libraries. Um, police stop stations, all these things that are necessary. So the infrastructure's there, the fiber's there, the roads, the infrastructure, all the things you want, all your art, culture, your uh, faith, uh, your communities of worship are there. Um, and you have the St. Jones River there, so it's a nice place uh, with the river walk. So the idea is what can we do from a public policy perspective uh, to encourage people to live downtown? Why would you want to live there? Well, first, I think the public space should be second to none. Our river walk, our Friendship Fountain, our Met Park, uh, the JEA generating site, should be wonderful pieces of property that people enjoy coming to. Uh, that should be an attraction. Uh, we know in other cities, the highest property values usually exist on property overlooking or adjacent to public space that's well managed. So we should have good public space. And today we don't have quality space. We have good land, good location, but uh, Met Park is in decay, Friendship Fountain is in decay, the Riverwalk is in decay. Uh, because we haven't had uh, capital dollars uh, in this budget, uh, we have not been able to keep up with the maintenance. That's number one. Number two, um, I think programming is important. Uh, people like to be near activity. Uh, they like to be where things are happening. And, and you've got a collection downtown of uh, pretty good attractions. You've got a wonderful state-of-the-art library with 300 high-speed computers and wonderful uh, space. Uh, you've got your wonderful performing arts center that was redone during the Renaissance program. Uh, the arena, the ballpark, the stadium, our first-tier uh, facilities. The access to the river and, and the river walk. You start to form uh, a collection of attractions combined with programming of festivals. Uh, so, you, so you make the Georgia-Florida uh, game a bigger weekend event. You make the, uh, the Gator Bowl a bigger weekend event. Fourth of July, we filled up every hotel room in downtown Jacksonville, Fourth of July, for one reason. 
because we had a fan phenomenal fireworks show. So there's economic return in form of economic impact and bed tax as a result of that event. Uh, so the low hanging fruit on attracting people downtown is quality, quality public space, and good programming. Those are things we can do today um, as we start to build a case for why we want investment downtown and why would people want to live downtown. You would mentioned the bed taxes and, and the full hotel rooms on the 4th of July. What sort of feedback have you gotten from the travel and leisure industry in Jacksonville Listen, on your budget? Two years in a row, we have filled up every hotel room in Jacksonville on 4th of July. We are owning that holiday. Um, we have great concerts, wonderful river access, fantastic fireworks show. Our hotels appreciate it. Our restaurants appreciate it. The retailers appreciate it. All those street vendors do really, really well. That's key to their business. Um, so there is a quantifiable return on that investment. Um, but when you're going through a budget process and you're looking for quick, cheap savings, um, you don't look at the long-term economic impact. You look, how much will I save this year on this line item? And that's my concern is when we get in a budget crisis, we start making really bad short-term decisions that cost us over time. Uh, so for that reason, we're advocating status quo. The only way we can keep status quo is to trim $40 million out of this budget, which I'm proposing. Add a slight modest increase in the millage, which is about $8 per month on the typical homeowner. Uh, and, of course, reform pension. And that's the three-part plan that I think walks us through this crisis as we know it. And to walk just a little bit away from arts and culture, but also getting into city events, it's a, my understanding that uh, if your tax proposal doesn't go through, there's also very uh, basic public services in jeopardy, such as clean up after Florida Georgia game. Was that something that the city would have to sacrifice? Well, in well remember, budget? when we when, you, when we talk about what would be cut, I have put on the table a list that I think is realistic. Um, that's my list. Those are my priorities. Everyone, as I said during the budget address, everyone has a different list of priorities. But I think it is safe to say that there are fundamental services that are at risk when you start taking $50 million and you extract that out of this government. Um, I think it really has a, a damning effect on this year's budget. But failure to fix it even this year, I think, has a devastating impact on next year's budget. So um, you have to take the long-term view. What are we going to do this year? What are we going to do next year? And by the way, what long-term economic returns are we denying ourselves by making short-term knee-jerk reactions? Mm -hmm. In terms of long-term, how, how would you see the city's cultural sector, say, 10 years from now, based on this budget proposal today? Do you see it sustaining and remaining status quo for that long, or do you see this being an investment in it? I think status quo is our best hope right now. I mean, we're going through a really tough time. Um, status quo is our best-case scenario, and that's all this budget is proposing, is we not do more, we just keep doing some of the things we've been doing. Um, and, and I would I would hope that as the economy turns uh, and we start to bring in more revenue, we can start to invest in the Riverwalk repairs, the park improvements, um, the public space enhancements, and also the programming that does give us a return on investment in terms of economic impact, bringing people to our urban core, creating an environment where more people want to live. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked before about the, the there is a mentality out there of government being bad, it should be starved, that we shouldn't be paying for anything driving on dirt roads and, and so forth. H have you heard any arguments from the public or from your staff or from anyone of uh, convincing you that perhaps we shouldn't be putting money into cultural programs in Jacksonville? Well, listen, there, there are citizens in this community and, and members of our council. Clay Yarborough has been trying to defund arts and culture and children's programming and, and public service grants since he's been on this council. Um, he is anti almost everything. Um, and, and we will fight him, you know, profusely. Um, I think his, the notion of him divesting this community is a bad strategy, long-term strategy, and I think it would be bad for the city. Um, he represents constituents that believe that. There are people that believe we should pay no taxes and we should drive on dirt roads. And I will never make that group happy. Um, this government will never make that. One dollar is too much for them. They're, um, uh, in many ways, their views are extreme. Uh, but I do believe there are... Uh, a, a number of citizens uh, that may not weigh in on the political process every day, but appreciate a lot of the things this government does. Um, I don't believe government is bad. Uh, this is the vehicle by which we've been given to build our community, uh, to set our course, and, and, uh, um, and this is how we invest in our community. Uh, and I believe our community has a very bright future and is worthy of investment. And, and this is a place where I'm raising two boys, have a, a family business, um, love the city. I was born here. Um, I would hate to be in a city that doesn't believe in itself enough to want to invest. And there are those on council who absolutely want to divest uh, this government and this city, uh, and we will hold them off as best we can, as long as we can. Mm -hmm. And we've gone through the numbers before that the city has a position of having spent, being spending the, the least on police, parks, mm -hmm. 
roads, everything in the state. How, how does arts and culture rank among other Florida cities in yeah. terms of what Jacksonville yeah. spends? Not only are we spending the least, we have a finance committee that now has gone on record wanting to spend an extra $200,000 over a process flaw uh, to move the millage. Um, so uh, it, 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 this is a strange time. And, uh, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that the full council will weigh in and hopefully uh, will prevail next Tuesday. But um, listen, police and fire is a fundamental government service. We'll be talking more about them, I guess, tomorrow. Um, uh, we have um, experienced growth in those departments, uh, but most of the growth has been because of pension and health care related costs. We have added 40 police officers, but when you strip away the 40 officers and the health care and pension related costs, you're not seeing much of an increase in that department. Um, so again, it's been a status quo type of program outside of Jacksonville Jury. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the $200,000 it would mm -hmm. cost to re-notice mm -hmm. the millage. Uh, any idea what that might pay for in terms of cultural programming? Listen, $200,000 is a lot of money in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of organizations that could you know, balance their budget with that money alone. And to say it's a drop in the bucket, which was a quote, I believe, from Clay Yarbrough yesterday, is a disrespectful comment to this community. I think that, that that's big money, serious money, um, and every dollar should be taken seriously. Uh, I, I understand the budget for uh, arts and culture, so to speak, which is everything from the fireworks, the air show. Um, the uh, the budget is around $4 million, and this year there would be around $3 million cut out of it, mm -hmm. another million remaining because of some contra contractual obligations to continue having certain shows that have already been booked, but then the entire $4 million would be phased out over two years. Mm -hmm. So that would mean no more air show, no, it, it would just be out of the budget? You know, the air show is, um, is, a, is a great example of a, a special event that um, really pays tribute to our military presence. Uh, let's remember, uh, we have over 250,000 people in this community that are tied to this military presence. Either they're retired, they're veterans, or they're active duty personnel. Their presence in this community represents about a $12 billion economic impact. We have an air show that is good for our military and good for our community and is exciting and enjoyable for everybody and it is free. Um, we spend a lot of money uh, putting on an air show. We do it uh, in town and we do it at the beach. We alternate both both places and, and I think it's, 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 it's a great event. Um, uh, it would be my hope um, that uh, we will not jeopardize that air show. I mean, we are a military town. This is a Navy town. Uh, we're the number one requested duty station in the United States of America uh, for the Navy, um, and and we should celebrate that. And 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 you know, I, I just watched the joy in my kids' eyes when they watch those planes fly over. Um, this is a free event. You can see it from almost, almost anywhere in town. They practice for a week. They put on a great show. Uh, it costs money to do that, um, uh, and and we don't want to see that go away. Quite frankly, and, and again, this budget would really be status quo. Is, is there a, an economic impact that you could share with us what that $4 million in the budget turns into as far as how many times it will turn over, how much people will spend on hotels related to all of those events? Yeah, we know it's about $200 million. Uh, mm -hmm. We know the total impact from the event programming we do is about a $200 million program mm -hmm. um, uh, benefit to us. And, of course, um, that there's usually a multiplier on that. So uh, when, when someone comes and spends money either in a hotel room or a restaurant or retail, um, when they leave money in Jacksonville, uh, we measure that in the form of impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of this uh, explanation is that the $200 million, of course, that's not money that comes right back into the city's budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think a lot of people would ask why that, that can't be a revenue source or why these events can't be a revenue source. How do you, uh, how, how, what is your sales tactic to people is to explain well, why to remember, keep that Well, remember, okay, when, when a restaurant does well because of our mm -hmm. special event, they're paying taxes. Their viability makes them eligible to pay their taxes. And it also increases the tax base and the property they're, they're renting. So it is indirect and is long term, but it's real. And, and you have to remember that. So you know, when, when our retailers and our, our vendors succeed, they are contributors to this economy. They pay rent to someone. They pay taxes to the government. They pay sales tax to the state, bed tax to the hoteliers. So all these things are, uh, re re create a rising tide for all boats. So um, again, the long term benefit is enormous. Um, but again, it is a line item on the budget that is low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's easy pickings. The council uh, swept a million dollars from special events just two years ago. Um, and, and again, I, I hope that we can uh, avoid that this year. I think it was two weeks ago when you were having chats with uh, various <laughs> interest groups about the budget. The church over by Hemming Plaza was one that became incredibly <clears throat> full on a Tuesday afternoon. What, what do you think that says about what people want out of arts and culture in Jacksonville? 
I, I really think that the bigger question is this. If we're going to attract jobs to Jacksonville and, and, and families that want to live in Jacksonville, uh, we have to be competitive. Uh, and, and with technology the way it is today, um, businesses and families can really work almost anywhere they want. They don't have to be next door to the plant or next door to the raw material. Technology creates mobility that we've never had before. So people have more choices and they can choose to live where they want to live. And, and where are they going to choose? They're going to choose those communities that have a, a wonderful quality of life, that have an active cultural community, an active arts community. Having an NFL is certainly nice. Having great sports venues, a St. John's River, the Atlantic Ocean. We need to make sure that we offer that portfolio of enticements uh, that makes us more competitive than the next city. Arts and culture is a critical line item for the type of employees we want to attract here. Uh, the higher wage earners weigh that heavily. Uh, and they want to be around art and culture. They want their kids to be around art and culture. They want to be in a community that believes and supports in art and culture. And we have a tremendous donor base of private sector individuals and corporations that give to many of these institutions. But we do a little bit too. The city contributes too. And and uh, and while you know that percentage of our budget for art and culture is probably uh, one tenth of one percent of our budget, um, it's huge impact to those organizations that are receiving the dollars. So to say, well, we're going to eliminate it and, and balance the budget, not realistic. Um, the, the, the savings is minuscule to us on a billion dollar budget, but to them it's the difference between existence or non-existence. Mm -hmm. have, have you had any problems uh, with this part of the budget based on just G Jacksonville's unique geography? And what I mean by that is people say living near St. John's County line mm -hmm. might say, well, why, why do I want all arts and culture funding? I don't go downtown for anything. Have you, have you heard from people who just kind of in the mind's eye don't use these services so they don't... Well, we have to create a reason for them to come downtown. I mean, and, and when you have uh, thriving museums and you have a thriving first-class Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra, when you have an NFL team, when you have uh, visiting uh, theater uh, acts uh, at the Moran Theater um, through the FCCJ Artist Series, uh, that you create a reason. And, and downtown is the place where we come together as a community. It is, it is the urban core of the entire region. Um, you have the river. You have your venues. You have... Uh, uh, wonderful um, uh, parks that have even greater potential. So um, we have to create that reason. And, and uh, in absence of that, uh, we forego ourselves the opportunity of the economic impact and the vibrancy of our downtown. Um, again, it is smart for us to make Jacksonville downtown viable. Uh, the infrastructure is there. We don't have to spend many more dollars uh, to provide a setting for people to live in a high density capacity where you can accommodate a lot of the future project, projected growth we have in this county. So it is in our interest to have them go there. Uh, and, and we should program it and we should respect the park spaces and the, and the public land to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I think I want to go to some readers. I've been talking too much myself. I, I wanted to uh, share with you uh, a note that we got from one of our readers, Martha Wilmering. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty extensive. I'll read part of it to you, though. She, she says the the jazz festival might seem like a frivolous expense to most. However, I attend many, many, many hours of it this year and spoke to a lot of people. They were all from out of town, a long way out of town. Her inter the interpretation is being that this is a, a boom of an event and not to take it away. She said this is just a comment, not a question. But, you know, in, in, remember, we had bad weather. Mm -hmm. um, we had a venue change, and it was still successful. Um, this is the kind of potential uh, event we can grow and really put Jacksonville on the map and, and, and have people come from all over the southeast, maybe even all over the country. Jazz has an amazing following. So um, it has it has a history. The event has a history. Um, we've we've um, uh, faltered a few times, uh, didn't have it a few years, and brought it back, moved it all around, started at Mayport, I believe. It's been moved all around. Uh, so we have a great heritage with this event, but we can grow it. We can grow it and make it bigger and better. And with the history we have already under our belts, it's a natural thing to play to our strengths. So I hope we can do a better job, not a lesser job. And again, I'm proposing a budget that doesn't make Jacksonville lesser. It just holds it holds its own, resets the millage back to where it was before Tallahassee started meddling in local affairs, um, and allows us to provide status quo for things like arts and culture in Jacksonville. Speaking of Tallahassee, uh, has this the help, if any, from the state government? Has it gotten any better, any worse, for to, to try and help? These events. I think every time. every cultural organization will tell you that they've been cut drastically by the state government, and it's reasonable to think that the federal government funds are drying up as well. You combine that with individual donors and corporate donors that are not giving at the generous levels they used to when the economy was strong. A lot of reliance now comes back to the city, and, and I really believe if we cut back on our investment in these organizations, which again is a fraction of one percent of our budget, but means the world to their budget, 
um, we will actually lose uh, some premier arts organizations in this town, given this economic cycle. And Tia has some reader readers chiming in too. Yes. You always catch me right as I'm finishing. Sorry. Okay, we're going to go to um, Drop IO. This um, caller has a question about the courthouse. $900,000 for artwork in the new courthouse is ridiculous. Use the student artwork from area schools, put the $900,000 in something else, like the roads. That's a, a good question. Uh, we have a line item in the courthouse budget designed for artwork. Remember, this building is uh, bohemoth in size. Um, it is uh, north of 600,000 square feet. Um, it has a lot of wall space, and, and uh, um, the art is one thing, but even just framing, even framing um, whatever you select has an enormous cost. I think that's a great suggestion, engaging local artists, particularly the students. Um, I don't know how much money it would save us, really, because by the time you frame and mat uh, and, and procure, um, you'd probably still be running an enormous expense. But um, again, uh, on the project, on the scale of the project, um, it, is, it is not that much money. It's that we're spending nearly $400 million on the project, so it's a fraction of the project cost. But if there's a way to, to tap local talent, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with it. I think it's, it's a good suggestion. Has that cost gone up or down over time in that budget? I know the budget's been debated for quite a while. The courthouse budget? The, the, well, the art cost within the courthouse um, budget. It's based on a percentage of what the overall cost of the final project will be, and that's set by city council ordinance, and therefore... Um, you know, it would take an act of the city council to adjust the amount that is put aside for the art in public places. You know, I kind of equate it to, you know, building an interchange and then eliminating the landscaping budget. You know, you build an interchange, um, you want grass on it, you want some trees and, and some shrubbery so it has aesthetic uh, appeal. Courthouse the same way. It would be unthinkable to build this building and have no artwork in it. Um, we need to have some artwork, but I certainly do like the idea of tapping um, local artists and, and trying to uh, showcase local talent. When I used to work in a courthouse up north as a courthouse reporter, it was a big, beautiful Italian marble building that was built in 1907, and all the little tiles were so intricate, and there was just such a feeling of pride that the judges had in coming in there every day, because what you do is, it, it's a stage of human drama every day in a courthouse, and I, I'm wondering, looking at, at a sort of a masterpiece of a building like that, and what we're trying to get, has there been any look at trying to rein in the cost to try and keep it a little more practical in today's dollars, a little less grandiose. Yeah. Well, I think, David, you weren't here for the first set of plans, and the first set of plans were grandiose. It was a, looked more like a wedding cake, and uh, it was a beautiful it was a beautiful rendering. I mean, it looked like something from another era, um, and I wish we could have built that. Uh, the escalations that would cost uh, due to the intricate detail of the design became um, unaffordable. Uh, so we scrapped those plans, and we've actually come back with a, a building that I think if you were to see them in comparison side by side is very, very modest uh, in comparison to the detail that we saw in the old building. So we're going to have a building that's functional. Uh, we're going to have a building that um, is practical. Uh, it will meet the, the post-9-11 uh, standards for safety, um, and it will get government off the river. Uh, we're going to put close to 3,000 people to work uh, building this thing in the next two years, and, um, and quite frankly, we're getting the most competitive bids uh, we've seen. Um, because of this economy. So I think this is the right time to build it. Remember, the dollars we're using to build this courthouse primarily are coming from the Better Jackson Plan, which was approved in 2000 by the voters of Duval County. Um, about $240 million of this project cost is sitting there and can be spent on nothing else. The remaining balance of uh, cost increases is going to be basically funded over time through uh, issu issuance of debt. Um, and the interest cost on that is not a game changer. So um, I think it's the right thing to do. And, and certainly it's probably the most popular question I get is why build a courthouse in this environment? But I think when you look at the alternatives and the funding source and the fact that we're putting people to work and getting competitive bids, um, the time is right. Do we have some more readers? Oh, yes. Okay, where do I start? Zeller asks, um, Mayor Payton, what do you have to say about the enormous cuts to the Soulsbacher Center funding? How can you let that happen to a program that is so needed and even needs more funding than it currently gets? Well, remember, I'm not advocating that we cut the Soulsbacher Center. In fact, I'm advocating that we pursue status quo funding. 
uh, Sulzbacher Center is one of our premier uh, homeless shelters in town. They do a great job. Um, and if it were not for them, I think we'd have a lot of challenges in this community um, uh, if these residents didn't have an alternative. Uh, so again, um, you'd have to ask uh, the members on the city council uh, that do not want to raise this millage why they would want to close it or why they'd want to um, not fund it. Uh, that would be one of their options. Uh, but I am not advocating defunding the Salzbacher Center. If we could go to the subject of the library within this uh, talk, the uh, I have a question from a reader, Wendy Honigman, uh, described as a devoted library user. Mm -hmm. She asks, why don't you ask for a small one dollar to five dollar fee when it's time to update or renew library cards? Interesting idea. Um, you know, we have tremendous circulation. We have nearly uh, five hundred visitors to our library system a year, um, and uh, that's up about three percent over last year, so we're seeing uh, uh, in this time of recession, people are using this free service, and, and I think maybe we should consider that someday. I would not consider it in this environment because um, the free alternative, I think, is particularly appreciated. Um, so I, uh, I've seen other counties do that. Um, it is something we should consider, but um, not advocating it in this budget. And we do charge for people who live outside of the county that use our library system. But I also think that there's some state restrictions on charging for um, library cards and, and that kind of thing that might jeopardize some of our state funding as well. And so that's something that would have to be looked at. I think I noticed the other day at one of your budget talks there was a little sign near the computers that if you didn't have a library card there was a charge for internet access. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much revenue that, that gets a year? Is it just nominal or is it... That's new. Um, the library board just uh, voted on that last month, I believe, and so we don't have any data yet as to how much it will generate, but that is new. And it's amazing. You know, we have um, hundreds of computers in our library system, and uh, maybe people aren't taking out books, but they're using that internet, high-speed internet, for um, access that they otherwise wouldn't have. The main downtown library alone has 300 computers in it. Uh, so it's not just a place where books are sitting on shelves. It's an active place where there's uh, computer engagement, there's meeting space, there's uh, you know, workshops, uh, book clubs, uh, it's a gathering spot. So uh, you know, the, the nature of a library uh, uh, is really changing uh, with technology. One of the interesting things I, I, I feel about the library budget is, although there were cuts to it, uh, and the material, the material budget appears to be remaining steady with last year, salaries are going down, the budget overall is still up $3 million in the proposed budget, but is this not the story of many of the other city departments, the woes being pension or health care? Let me tell you, pension and health care are driving the costs in government. Uh, it is not increase, uh, increasing the size of government. It is employee-related expenses that are primarily driving it. That is why we have a very aggressive pension reform plan on the table today, um, and, and that's why we are out to bid right now on a new health care plan. And uh, the, the market will tell us how to save money, uh, on health care, but the, the, um, our preliminary look is discouraging. It looks like it's not going down, it's going up. Uh, so uh, uh, we're doing all we can to try to curb those expenses. And he has another reader. Yes, Matt asks, I've noticed that Jacksonville, especially downtown, seems to have huge potential for standing out as a city of art and culture. Does the mayor agree, and if so, how does he plan to help nurture the development of arts and culture in Jacksonville? Well, I think the first step is let's not defund arts and culture, and, and let's, uh, uh, let's celebrate our city and, and be bold about um, investing in art and culture here. And um, this budget I'm proposing uh, would not represent decreasing investment in arts. We have trimmed the arts and culture budget for years. I think we've done enough, um, and uh, quite frankly, we probably need to do more. So um, this budget I'm proposing and the three-part plan to resolve the crisis we're in uh, support status quo funding of arts and culture. I'm hoping as the economy returns we'll have more resources someday uh, to do more, uh, particularly when it comes to investment and in premier institutions, but also our public space along the river and the parks. Um, but I'm not advocating we trim. I was thinking your predecessor, Mayor Delaney, is now the president of UNF, and I'm wondering how can you work maybe with some of the colleges around here to try and boost that, that profile. And, and we've actually, um, uh, we've seen partnerships forming. Um, the Museum of Modern Art uh, is now uh, in a partnership with UNF um, that works out favorably for both of them. Uh, and uh, um, that's something they negotiated offline, and uh, I think it's a pretty good deal. Um, but I think in this environment, everyone's trying to be creative in how they uh, do public-private partnerships, and the museums are certainly not immune to that process. And uh, we've seen some pretty innovative things come out of it. 
Specifically with the library, uh, it, library use is up right now. Wouldn't it make sense to try to put more investment into it? Would love to. Um, I think uh, the first part of our three-part plan is to cut budget where we can and be aggressive but responsible in cutting the budget. And we're doing that primarily on the backs of city employees. The library system is labor intensive, so they're going to feel it. But this is not the time, I think, to do more. It's a time to hold on to what we're doing. And uh, the budget I'm proposing really is just status quo. Um, in this environment, I, I think it'd be a hard sell and probably not the right thing to do. Uh, but having said that, I don't want to diminish this wonderful system that is free uh, to our citizens. The library has a lot of volunteer programs, too. Has the volunteerism at the library grown or decreased over the years? We have a really uh, two organizations that are fantastic. One, the Friends of the Library, which is a great organization that, that is, advocates for the library and provides volunteer time and services. Um, but you also have the, um, the Foundation Board, uh, which has done a phenomenal job over time uh, providing leadership for um, um, raising substantial dollars to complement our system. Um, those are both volunteer-run. Um, and, um, and they're great contributors. And those partnerships allow us to do more than we otherwise would be able to do if we only had taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. Do you have another reader question? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, Bella says, um, this is an interesting one, and um, why don't we have more sizable art downtown? Is there a requirement for art with any sizable new building permit. I guess Bella's asking for like big sculptures mm -hmm. or things like that. Uh, we have a program called Art in Public Places uh, that uh, has done a pretty good job over time uh, making sure we carve out a percentage of capital projects and invest in art in public places. And I would showcase uh, where they've done a good work. Um, uh, around the arena we have uh, the sculpturesque type of art. Uh, the Equestrian Center has a, a, a huge sculpture of horses. Um, almost everywhere you move around the city uh, where you've seen a major capital investment in a public facility, you've seen investment in art. The most recent celebration of art in public places is the Tilly Fowler Memorial on the, the North Bank Riverwalk, which is a phenomenal sculpture uh, on our river that uh, will be a nice tribute to her contributions to our community for many years. Um, I think there's certainly a desire uh, to, to increase our public art. We allocate a portion of our budget for capital projects to make sure we do that. And we encourage uh, uh, private sector investment to do the same. And collectively, uh, I think over time, we will make a difference. We'll be talking more about Jacksonville Journey tomorrow, but I think it also fits into this discussion as well, the idea of trying to reform society to try to curb crime and violence. And how do you think cultural events fit into that overall idea? You know, a lot of times... Uh, we use sports as a way to transfer values with young kids, particularly kids at risk, but I think art is just as effective. Not every child is gifted with athletic uh, ability, um, but they do have a knack for a talent, perhaps in the art world. So um, any venue we can create, be it sports or be it art, uh, be it nature, um, we should try to engage kids. And again, uh, the notion is let's create an environment where we can um, gain life skills uh, through the discipline of an art or a sport. Um, or a, a, a nature outing. So uh, um, I think it, all of these things are viable ways to engage at-risk youth, and it saves us a lot of money in the long term. If we can engage youth in a constructive way um, and avoid um, um, mistakes being made, wrong paths taken, um, we save money because the cost of violence in this community is great. Um, the cost of incarceration is great. Um, I think we can do a better job by engaging youth sooner. And art is a great way to do that. Obviously, there's a lot of support in keeping arts funding from the organizations that get the, the grant money directly, uh, but from people who aren't directly in those organizations, the business community, mm -hmm. what, what sort of feedback have you heard from people who are disconnected? Yeah, you, you know, I think the Jacksonville Journey, which was we'll talk about tomorrow, but uh, a, a comprehensive citizen-driven solution to violence in our community. Um, I think one of the aha moments uh, the people on that commission had was Look, it's not just about arresting our way out of the program. It's about engaging youth. It's about engaging uh, with intervention programs to redirect those who've made mistakes and have served their time. Um, the youth component, uh, when you look at that particular segment of the investment of Jacksonville Drake, it is all about keeping kids busy, keeping them doing constructive things. So I think there's, there's an, enlightened, an enlightened awareness in this town um, that uh, those type of investments have long-term benefit. Do, you, do we have any other? I mean, well, we have many. Okay, TK asks a more general tax question. He says, how can we continue to maintain the largest city by area in the U.S.
with one of the smallest population bases by metro area, that will always equal higher taxes. Interesting question. Um, Jacksonville is now the 12th largest city in America in population. It is the largest in landmass. Um, and so um, uh, keeping up with uh, the investment needed for the inevitable growth is going to be an ongoing challenge, um, particularly as we see the rural areas convert into housing communities and industrial development. So um, each year we, we try to strike the balance. And uh, I think if we've erred in one way or the other, we've probably erred on the side of underinvestment. Our millage rate is 20% lower than the next lowest of any metropolitan county in the state. Um, uh, when you look at our tax burden over the top 50 cities in America, we're number 46. Uh, we have done a really good job, almost too good of a job, uh, uh, providing government on the cheap. And my concern is if we uh, head down a road of uh, divestment now, um, we could do ir irreparable damage as we try to prepare Jacksonville uh, for what I think has a very bright future. You want another one? Sure. All righty. Let's see here what else we have. Okay, um, would it be possible for the city to step back from arts and culture investment in the future should higher paying employers come in? Would arts and culture be more self-sustaining? Self I think that's always the goal, to have a self-sustaining community, but um, the reality is um, I think there is a role for government. And if you look at how little dollars we spend in this area, again, it's a fraction of 1% of our budget um, is on a billion dollar budget is minuscule, um, but it makes a world of difference to those organizations that are receiving the grants. So uh, I think government should always have some role, um, but the private sector here has done a great job. Let me just tell you, um, I don't think we could ask much more uh, from private donors and members and, 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 and uh, corporations that participate in these organizations. They have been the lifeblood. Uh, what government does is simply a complement. Per the percentage we contribute to their budgets um, on their overall budget is very, very small. Uh, I would say we are complementing what they do, uh, not really creating um, you know, an unsustainable circumstance. Um, this is, um, there are a lot of people who, I guess, um, when the talk about the courthouse, and someone says another um, idea to throw out for you is for the artwork for the courthouse, you know, Mocha and Comer have art. How about having galleries in the new courthouse representing these museums? There's mm -hmm. also a lot of private art, and maybe hallways and areas can be named for those private lenders. It's a good idea, and we've actually done that. Uh, we have art on loan in several public buildings. The, the one that comes to mind uh, uh, first is the Time Union Performing Arts Center. Um, many of those pieces are uh, donated from various collectors. Uh, Preston Haskell, for one, has been very generous with his collection. Uh, we should look at that. Um, it's a great way to have rotating art, uh, keep the scenery changing, save money, um, and, and, and complement the building. So, again, uh, there will still be a need in a huge building like that for artwork and corridors and, 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 and back offices. But I think in the lobby areas where there's a lot of traffic and the very dramatic spaces, certainly you may want to showcase showcase some private artwork, um, and we've done that well at the time Jimmy performing our center. Keep going? Okay. Um, this one, you know, when you were talking about making money decisions, TKS, what about the air show in Paris that city officials spend money on? He says every year, but I know the it travels, it's not always in Paris. Why aren't things like that on the chopping block? It's a really good question. I, I think, um, the media's had a lot of fun with that trip, but the truth of the matter is my trip uh, for me cost uh, about $3,000 for airfare and hotel room. Um, and, and I would argue that that's probably some of the best money uh, spent in a long time because we have this amazing asset called Cecil Commerce Center. We have 15,000 acres out there with a, a long runway and a tremendous capacity for industrial development. Um, that facility is built for the aviation industry. The, avi the aviation industry comes together once a year. We don't get to pick where they come together, but it was in Paris this year. All the upper management of every aviation company in the world um, meets there. And for us to have exposure to them, uh, with all of them in one place, uh, is tremendous value. Uh, trying to meet with that management group of each one of those companies, and I met with probably in a dozen companies while I was there. Um, all of them have an interest in Cecil Field, by the way, for future expansion. 
if I were to try to meet with each one of those companies individually, flying all over the world, because they're all from different countries, and trying to meet with those executives, uh, it would be cost prohibitive and virtually impossible probably to schedule this, mm-hmm. these executives. They're all there with the intention of meeting uh, people to uh, do uh, business deals. Uh, so um, it, 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 while it may seem extravagant, uh, it's probably one of the hardest working trips I've been on. Between the jet lag and the schedule, I come home exhausted. Um, and uh, uh, so it, it may seem uh, like fluff, but the truth of the matter is you can't sell the city by never leaving the city. Uh, you have to leave and, 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 and make the case. And, and for me, it's a great honor and privilege to represent our city abroad. Um, I'm not a big traveler. I don't enjoy being away from my family. But I think it's an important part of this job. And I hope that future mayors consider it an important part because I don't think we'll be successful selling the city unless we get outside of our boundaries and talk about it. I'm um, specific to the part of this discussion focusing on libraries. Uh, the important note to make is that the libraries, even with the tax increase, would be looking at a $1.1 million reduction in funding. I think that the library system is talking about reducing hours, but without, we'd be talking about $2.8 million more, which would be shutting libraries down. And have uh, has the city de- de- determined which libraries those would be or had any discussions about which those would be? I hope we don't get to that point where we have to have that discussion. Um, I'm hoping the council will have the wisdom to raise the millage and we don't have to talk about shuttering libraries. But um, should we have to do that? Um, what I would recommend is we go back to the board of directors of the library, which is the volunteer board, and ask them, you know, here's the budget. What would you do? How would you make this work? And uh, I hope we don't have that discussion, uh, but that would be the next step. Mm-hmm. The, the uh, system grew by a number of libraries just as you were taking office, mm-hmm. too. With this, with, with the I- idea of closing libraries at a time when they're growing, that, mm-hmm. would, would that be... Uh, well, I think yeah, the system virtually doubled um, when I was coming into office because of the Better Daxville plan. We uh, built a large new downtown library and we uh, added branches, we re- renovated branches. So. Um, we, we virtually doubled the size, and that was an enormous burden on the budget, as you can imagine. Uh, the Better Jackson Plan had capital dollars to build these facilities, but there were no operating dollars because you can't use sales tax, quite frankly, for operating. So um, we've, we've had a lot of growth, and, and um, trying to maintain a quality system as large as it, as it is has been a challenge. Okay, can we finish with some readers? Mm-hmm. David, could I add something while sure. she's getting that question? The library still has free access to Internet, which we they have found that it's been very important in this economic time because of people applying for services, people who are in need, applying for jobs, looking for housing. Um, and so I didn't want to leave the impression that um, there is not free access to the Internet at the libraries because there certainly is, and we are seeing a tremendous growth, so much so that we have people waiting to use those computers in the library because of wanting to access needs and services and information and that kind of thing. Once you've had access to high speed, it's hard to, hard to go back. Yeah. And let me just, my compliments to Roz and her team who really do a good job uh, getting uh, the most out of every taxpayer dollar with systems like the library, with our park system, and the things that Roz is, uh, has, has reporting to her. Um, again, uh, on, on numerous occasions, our city employees always rise to the occasion to, uh, when asked to do more with less, and, and uh, this is an example. Uh, our library system has uh, been doing a good job through the years. And we just want to clarify, um, this is going back in the, um, and I'm going to publish a couple of comments that people said, but when you were, we were talking before about the $200,000 risk that the council said they'll take if they decide to come back and raise the millage, it'll cost $200,000. And you said Clay Yarbrough might have used the word chump change. I put a note at the time that I didn't think he said it, and a couple of readers backed me up. That was Bill Bishop. And that's, well, we just, I just uh, want to make okay. sure we go on the record. Yeah, I think I got that from um, you now. Yeah that it was Bill Bishop who said the word, who mm-hmm. used it, chump change, to our recollection. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll go ahead and put all that out there. Um, and then we'll, let's see here. Okay. Have, Joseph asks, have we looked at any green consumption-based taxes, such as a fee on plastic bags? Some locations are charging the, and I know you talked about that, but it comes up a lot, so any new ways to generate fees through taxes? Um, I know I know some cities have instituted a charge for plastic bags in grocery stores uh, with uh, the hopes of causing people to use recycled grocery bags. Um, my my assumption is, and I don't know this for sure, is that that's not a big revenue producer. It's a, it's a behavior changer, but not a revenue producer. 
Um, but certainly we look at all options. We looked at sales tax. That's not optional because you can only use it on capital projects. Uh, we looked at gas tax. We can only use that on highway projects. Uh, and gas is so volatile, um, I think it's already a little high. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we had fees put in two years ago. Uh, we've already done that. So the millage rate is an area where we thought it made more sense because our millage rate is 20% lower than the next lowest in the, in the state. Um, we haven't had an increase in 17 years. Um, and, it, and it's not a regressive form of taxation. It's a, uh, uh, it scales. If, if a property owner has a, you know, a home valued at less than $50,000, uh, they're virtually uh, homestead exempted out of the, the equation. So our lower income, the lower assessed homes um, don't pay as much, uh, which I think uh, there's something to be said for that uh, during the recession. And let's see here. I'll, I'll do one more. Um, well, ooh, there are two more. What portion, Aaron Hall asks, what portion of the budget goes directly or indirectly to fund the Jaguar, Jaguars? Is there a way to reduce that amount? Uh, we have a, con a contractual obligation to the Jaguars for uh, game day expenses. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, the maintaining of the building. Uh, that's our building, the taxpayers on that building. So there are certain obligations with keeping you know, the roof from leaking, the air conditioner is running. Um, but again, those are long term contractual agreements that were put in place when the Jaguars came to Jacksonville. Um, and uh, I will tell you, uh, Jaguars are having a tough time. Um, and I hope uh, our viewers and listeners are doing all they can to buy tickets to help them uh, through this tough time. Okay, and then. Um Let's see here. Billy asks, and we can make this the last question if you want. Billy asks, does the mayor feel that his defeat at Trail Ridge has hurt him in the budget fight because people don't trust him anymore? I don't think so. Um, you know, I think uh, Trail Ridge was a dispute um, really about uh, whether we should go to bid or not. Um, and there are different opinions. I put a proposal on the table that um, avoided litigation, which we are now in. This is going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. Um, and the council uh, preferred to have an option to bid. Uh, I still think we should have negotiated this uh, legal issue out. Um, we have untold exposure because we do not have a resolution to the legal dispute. Um, but this is not the route council wanted to go, and that's that's the way the system works, checks and balances. So um, we don't always agree. We didn't agree on this case, uh, and, and there'll be other instances where we don't agree. But I don't uh, I don't think there's anything spilling over from uh, those disputes. Okay. Mayor, anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks for joining us, Mayor Thank Payton you, and Ross Phillips. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be doing this chat again where the topic will be public safety. That starts at 11 a.m. I'm David Hunt, and thanks to Tia Mitchell, Jason Pratt, and Jonathan Bennett, our production team.